Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Wagner. I'm a prosthodontist in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I've been in practice for about 40 years, and I primarily do removable and maxillofacial prosthetics. Uh, most of my work is done in-house, and the technique that I'm going to show you today is something that I developed early in 2000 um, to reduce the time required to make a denture. It's called the Avident Wagner Easy Guide Protocol. What I'm going to show you is how to make a very, very high quality digital denture like you see here using a working model. This is not the denture at all. It's not none of the teeth that you see here will be used in the final product, but it's a working model that very much like a, a try and will allow you to be able to to modify and customize a denture at the second appointment rather than the traditional fourth appointment of five appointment technique. All of this is listed on my website, which is bigjawbone.com. And if you go there, you'll see a video link that will take you to 10 YouTube videos that show everything that I'm going to talk about tonight. So if don't worry if you don't get it this first time. All of us on YouTube would just type in Avident Wagner. It'll take you to it. Gives you an overview all the way to the completed technique. The um, work is really a com combination of two companies. Avident, which is a digital denture manufacturer in Phoenix, Arizona. They've had a long history in dentistry, starting with cone beam radiography, mini implants. Their engineers were involved in the development of um, Invisalign, and now they're working on digital dentures out of, uh, out of Phoenix. They can produce either a high quality uh, Densply Serona traditional denture or implant-based dentures as well. Uh, I mentioned Densply Serona. They are the materials company, and the materials used for this digital technique, uh, including their traditional 199 resin used in a very innovative way, and their high-quality IPN teeth uh, that have a long tradition in dentistry, all of this will be taken in the 21st century with this um, Avident Densply Serona technique. Why three appointments? Um, a a five-appointment technique worked great in 1950 when it was developed, but in the 21st century now, it costs us five to seven dollars a minute to run a practice. And if you try it, if, uh, the traditional technique that you learned in dental school, there's just, there's just no way that you can spend the time required to do it and be able to make a profit and feed your family at the same way, at, at the same time. So what I'm going to suggest here is a technique that's three short 30-minute appointments, not three short hour appointments. I'm going to show you how to make a denture in three 30-minute appointments. Uh, we're going to do three clinical steps, and there'll be two laboratory steps that we'll follow through. So let's start with clinical one. In clinic one, what we're going to do is we're going to make impressions, we're going to take measurements of the face in intraoral cavity, and we're going to um, select teeth. So let's start with impressions. I'm going to suggest that you use a uh, an impression tray that I developed um, called the Wagner Impression Tray, soon to be sold by Densply Serona. It consists of one maxillary and one mandibular impression, and it's to take the place of preliminary impressions and final impressions, combining the two into one. The armamentarium is a hot water source, a digital timer, a scissor of some sort, and of course the trays themselves. Um, I suggest going to Amazon and getting a $60, $60 um, digital temperature uh, LCD display to kettle. Uh, they're very accurate. We need to, to produce a some specific temperatures that I'll tell you about, but you don't have to spend $600 for a, a traditional handout water bath anymore. A uh, digital uh, tea kettle works well. You need a timer because we're going to time the um, amount of, um, we're going to time the trays as we heat them. Um, since we only have one size tray, um, you may need to make it smaller and you can trim on it. Um, each tray comes with an extra piece of material we call a gum stick, 
And that's the same material as you find in the tray, but it's much softer. And if you heat that, you can actually apply it to the heated tray if you need to make the tray bigger. The trays only come in one size, so you need to be able to manipulate them if you need to chair side. This is the technique. You take the tray, which comes in its own little bowl, and pour in 160 degree water. Wherever the tray turns color, it's gonna soften. So 160 degrees, and you're gonna keep it in for a minute, and you're gonna time, uh, time it with that timer. If you go, let it go longer, the tray might become too soft. If you don't go for a minute, it might be too hard to manipulate. Take that tray, place it in the patient's mouth, and have them go through border molding motions. That means uh, tightening their lips. I push it up in the palate so it goes, it follows the shape of the palate. And um, then, then you just use the technique that you, you learn the, use for a final impression. Take it out and examine it. The one thing with this tray is you can actually stretch the tray if you need to. One of the places where you traditionally mix, miss a, a maxillary final impression is over the tuberosities. And that's because a lot of times the trays are too short. With this tray, a warm tray, you can just stretch, which makes it much easier to adapt in the mouth. You can do the same thing on the lower. Uh, the big mistake for lower impressions is not getting over the pear-shaped pad. So with this tray, you just stretch it, just pull it, just make it a little longer so it goes over there if you need it. Makes it real easy. If the tray can't be stretched, it's just too much, uh, um, th there's just too much distance, take the, the extra material and add to it. Simple as that. If the, um, you can do the same thing on the lower. One of the big places you mix it, miss is not getting into that retromylohyoid area. This tray will allow you to do so. If the tray is too big, and it could be for a small mouth, take the warm tray and trim it with Dean scissors. It cuts very easily, and you can shape it, opening up Frina, taking off areas for uh, border molding materials, just whatever you want to do. After you get it done, you take it and smooth it with the, your hands and prepare the uh, tray for final impression. Once you like the shape of the tray, you place it in cold water and it hardens to um, its original hard state. So now let's, let's go ahead and make an impression. I'm showing you a three 30 minute technique. So we've got to get all this work done in appointment one in 30 minutes. I'm going to recommend that you follow this technique, but honestly, you can use whatever impression technique and whatever impression material you like. I like uh, Densply Serona's Aquasil Ultra Plus LV Fast Set. And if you look down on the lower right hand side, you can see that it sets in two and a half minutes. That's a big deal for me. And I like the various viscosities that comes in. First step with the tray is take and paint adhesive into the tray that's appropriate for the material you use. This is a PVS um, uh, tray adhesive that's appropriate for the Aquasil. I'm going to first use Aquasil Ultra Plus Rigid Fast Set. It's a thick viscosity material, and I found that it works real well for border molding my tray. Take your, uh, your painted tray and apply material all the way around the edges. And apply some material in the middle, and I'll show you why. Take that to the mouth, and again, have the patient go through border molding motions. Now, what you'll do is leave it in the mouth for two minutes and uh, two and a half minutes, uh, molding the uh, material for the first 30 seconds or so. Remove it and examine the tray, and start looking for areas where the tray has actually perforated the material that you placed. Um, any place that where the tray shows through, you're gonna presume that the tray is gonna be pushing on the tissues and you need to relieve it. And you do it simply with just a carbide burr and just grind out whatever areas 
present as show throughs. You could also create relief in the tray if you want to as well. Here's an example. If you look at the maxillary tray, you can see we're overextended in the tuberosity on the right. Uh, there's a show through on the left. Um, on the mandibular tray, you can see we're overextended in the anterior labial area. We're overextended in the mid uh, portion of the alveolar ridge and in the masseteric notch. Just simply take that carbide burr and grind those spots liberally. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take Aquasil Ultra LV fast set, light viscosity, and you're going to place that into the tray and we're going to make our final impression. Just the same way, just put a light coating over the tray, cover the middle, place it in the mouth, and hold it there doing border molding motions, removing it after two and a half minutes. Um, 99% of the time, you're done. This is your final impression. And we're probably at maybe between 10 and 15 minutes into that 30 minute segment. If you see any defects or if you want to increase the fidelity of the um, impression, you can use Aquacil Ultra XLV, extra light viscosity, and apply that in. It's very water like. Put it in the mouth, have them go through border molding motions, and remove it in two and a half minutes. In any case, you're done with your maxillary impression. You can then repeat the process on the mandible. Generally, Newcomers take about 40 minutes to, to do the procedure. Um, most people can get it under 30 once you get everybody organized and your auxiliaries uh, trained for the, for the process. Um, for instance, the auxiliary could, could shape your tray for you if you wanted to. So this is really a team effort and you can get it done in under 30 minutes. Okay, measurements. We're done with impressions. We're gonna now take several measurements of the face that we will record and send to your local laboratory uh, with your impressions when you're finished appointment one. We're gonna use a device called a avimeter by Avident. It's very similar to a traditional papillometer, which has been used since the 1930s, but it has a few other measurement devices that we'll, we'll look at. What you're going to do is take a measurement from the incisive papilla that usually sits right behind the central incisors and is usually pretty obvious in the edentulous ridge. You're going to take that um, papilla meter, place it up on the incisive papilla, and have the patient drape their lip over and to a relaxed position. This measurement is about 13 or 14 millimeters. You're going to record that, and I'll show you why here in a second. The um, incisive papilla really is a very important spot for any denture maker. Um, for instance, we know that it's um, approximately 12 millimeters behind the labial surface of the central incisors. That will help the technicians position those teeth. And we also know that if we measure from the incisive papilla down to the resting lip, we can determine and estimate the, inc the incisive edge of the central incisors. So just with that papilla, papilla meter, um, incisive papilla, we can determine the actual position of eight and nine. And any technician will tell you if they know the central incisor position, it makes it a lot easier for setting the rest of the teeth in a denture. Now, in younger people, when the patient is at rest, uh, they'll show up to three millimeters of tooth exposure. <clears throat> um, the tooth won't end exactly at the resting lip. But in uh, my mouth, I'm 70, uh, you don't see my upper teeth anymore. The, I'm probably a millimeter short. Um, all of those things can be taken into factors as you set your teeth. Now, one of the questions that comes up is what happens when the bone is lost in the maxilla? What happens to the papilla? Fortunately for us, the incisive papilla travels straight up as the bone is lost. So those measurements of 12 millimeters behind the central incisor and the IP measurement are all applicable until there's severe loss of the bone. If you look at this um, uh, 
dry bone, you, the line in purple is the incisive canal, and you can see it goes almost straight up and down um, until it gets into the bridge of the nose. I think the incisive papilla is tethered on that, so it goes straight up and down also. Um, so what we're gonna do is use those measurements to position the two central incisors as you see it in this working model. I'm gonna give you some more details about that later. Here's the technique. You take the patient, put him upright, place the avimeter onto the incisive papilla, and you can imagine now the incisive papilla is behind point zero on the avimeter. You then have them relax their lip to a position that would be not tensed, not smiling, but more relaxed. You just have them, you work, have them work with it a little bit and take that measurement. We then record that measurement uh, for the use by your laboratory. The second thing we do is we take that avimeter and take a measurement for the width of the nose. This width of the nose will give your designers a sense of where the canine should be in the denture. So by giving that measurement, we're positioning the canines for them um, in the computer. Next, you take a measurement between the uh, pupils of the eyes and record that. This will be used to determine teeth size, but not in the way that has been, was really taught in school. There were some people that said that there was a sense that there was a correlation between the pupils and the size of the central incisors. It's not true. We're going to use this in a different way, and I'll show you. So now let's use it. Uh, two selection. This fellow's name is J. Leon Williams. He, he was a dentist in about 1910, and he is a hero to uh, Densply Serona. He's the fellow that came up with the idea that the face um, reflects the shape of the central incisors. In other words, if you can sort of take the profile of the face, flip it over, you have a sense of the shape of the teeth. And back in the 20s and 30s, this was a big deal. I mean, they got down to the point where they, you could look at somebody and say, this person has a medium square face, uh, they get these teeth, somebody with a short square face, they get a, another set of teeth. I mean, I think all of us were taught this in dental school and all of us secretly said, well, you know what? I can't tell what shape face this person has. I mean, there were actually devices made that would allow you to um, determine the shape of the face and select a tooth. The truth is, is none of that works. There's no correlation between facial shape and tooth. Even though dental companies still tell, sell their teeth that way, I strongly feel that tooth selection is really the true art of denture making. Uh, this patient looks young and vibrant because we selected a tooth that looks right for that face. I didn't look at the face and make a determination of the tooth. I looked at the face and try to make a tooth that blended in with it. Um, this gives you a lot of security. So, I mean, the idea is that use your art to select a tooth. If you want somebody to have a robust, uh, strong looking tooth, just pick the right tooth for that, that catches your eye. Don't, don't feel that there's some formula that you don't understand that will get the one true tooth that matches that patient. The truth is, the patient can wear a lot of different shaped teeth and be very beautiful doing it. This is what I what I do in my office. If the patient has a um, high school picture that shows their teeth in some fidelity, I ask them if I could use that uh, that fi that picture to select their teeth. What I do is I take that inner pupillary measurement and then take a photograph using my iPhone of the patient's high school picture. This is all done chair side. I then take that picture and put it up on my computer and enlarge it by just pulling the side of the, of the, uh, of the image. It's, it, you know, you don't have to be precise, you just enlarge it until the point where the distance between the um, pupils in life equals the distance of the pupils on the photograph. In other words, since eyes don't change with time, the photo now is the actual size of the patient's face. That means 
that the teeth are the actual size of the patient's teeth when they were young and in high school. I simply then take my uh, mold guide and match it up to the patient, and this, I feel, gives you a true starting point for a tooth that's actually right for that patient. Uh, honestly, select the teeth the way you'd like to, but I think this works pretty well. So I've got my, my, my portrait IPN um, mold. Shea's another story. Since this is a simplified technique, I don't use a full range of shades to select teeth for dentures. I do for partials, but not for dentures. I actually have cut my shade guide down into, what is that, seven different shades, a couple of power whites, and I, use, I like the A shades. And I simply give it to the patient and ask them to select the tooth color that they want. Usually they'll pick A1, power white, maybe A2, rarely A3, certainly not A4. But what I found is that patients never complain about shade. They selected it, they're happy with it, they're proud of it in their denture. Okay, we just finished appointment one. Um, patients dismissed the impressions, the measurements that you took, and your mold and shade for tooth selection are sent to your laboratory. So we're now at lab one. What you're gonna do or what your laboratory is gonna do in lab, in lab one is make this digital working model. It uh, consists of a maxillary denture and a mandibular denture uh, with teeth held in wax, positioned using the measurements that you determined appointment one. Let me show you how it's done. First, the impression is scanned. Um, we're not gonna make a cast for this, it's, pure, it's purely digital. So they scan the impression. That could be done locally or it could be done uh, in, with, in Phoenix. Then a working model based on your impressions and tooth selection and tooth positions are milled or printed at Avident or in your local lab. And it's a device called a WTI or Wagner try-in. <clears throat> what I tried to do with this was get to the point where we could combine appointment three, two, actually three and four into one appointment um, so that we would be able to um, facilitate a, a faster, more efficient denture, denture technique. You'll see that with the WTI, we're not throwing anything out. We're using every tried and true technique that we were taught, but you, we're using it in a unique way. So with the WTI, you have a maxillary base that's milled, fits very well, just like a process base, it's very accurate. A mandibular base, um, eight maxillary teeth based on your mold and shade, and a group of teeth from 22 to 27 in one piece based on the uh, mold and shade of the maxilla. The maxillary base is very uh, thin, and its intaglio surface fits exactly to the um, to re reproduction of your final impression. There's no deviation, it's within microns of your impression. The front of the tray is very thin because I want you to be able to move teeth if you need to. I'll show you why that plays a part later on. It's so thin that you can actually see through it. And um, that that's really too thin for it to be structurally sound, but it makes it easy to move teeth in this WTI if you need to move it. Uh, the occlusal plane is set by two molars that are, are positioned flat plane on the on the on the base. Uh, the teeth themselves will be set up flat plane uh, based on measurements and some traditional techniques that were have been developed over time. The maxillary teeth. The maxillary teeth, as I said, will be set by to by on that flat occlusal plane using the IP measurement and that 12 millimeter anterior point marked in blue as the anterior port uh, portion and starting portion for setting those maxillary teeth. The horizontal plane is based on the pterygo maxillary fissures, uh, which we commonly call the hamular notches. The pterygo maxillary notches will give us a sense of the horizontal plane, since we really had no opportunity to compare this to the patient's pupils, which is the more traditional way of doing it. Um, each tooth is hologrammed 
out on the back of it because I want you to be able to take that tooth and move it backwards if you need to without having to pop the tooth out and grind on it. Uh, here's an example. If you look at the uh, denture tooth on the left and our um, uh, WTI tooth on the right, you'll see that it's, it has, it's hollow ground in the upper two thirds. The lower two third is left intact um, so that if we need to position that tooth in labioversion, we have some anatomic uh, uh, anatomy there so that the tooth can be turned and still have it look natural. Uh, as I said, the central incisors are set um, using the IP measurement. Um, we use that 12 millimeter measurement that comes from um, uh, from the literature to set the teeth in an anterior posterior direction. And we position the lower third of the central incisors so that surface is perpendicular to the occlusal plane. The canines are set in a similar way. Remember, we measure the, the width of the nose, so we have the sense laterally where to position the teeth and we've developed the occlusal plane so we know where to put the incisal tips of the, the, center, uh, the canines. But there is also another thing we can use anatomically which really helps us. It's been shown that 90% of canines um, are positioned where their incisal tip is on a line that bisects the incisor papilla and is perpendicular to the um, midline of the palate. In other words, now we've positioned those canines in three dimensions um, all on the computer. Remember the width, we use the width of the nose, uh, that gives us sun sense there. The arch form is shaped by, um, <clears throat> by uh, the shape of the uh, maxillary cast or maxillary uh, impression. And the mandibular teeth are shaped to follow those maxillary teeth. In other words, the maxillary teeth and the mandibular teeth are custom made for that patient. That arch form will, will fit that patient. Um, the man, mandibular teeth and base um, are arranged so that the incisal edge of the mandibular teeth sit over the vestibule of the mandibular impression. If you think about it, that's about where those teeth sit naturally in the mouth. Um, and we use some traditional techniques to develop the mandibular plane. Um, we take a measurement 18 millimeters from the vestibule up to the incisal angle, anter incisal angle anteriorly, and we go the traditional two thirds up the retromolar pad for the posterior portion of that. Uh, um, of the of the plane. I've just noticed that a couple of people have mentioned VDO. It's coming up. We haven't done it yet, and that's a good question. So this is what you're given, um, produced by the laboratory prior to your second appointment. All the teeth are set up, and they're set up in a wax that is um, looks like a setup wax, but it's unique to this technique. And I'll show you why here in a few minutes. Okay, clinical two. In clinical two, we're gonna do four things. We're gonna seat the base, we're gonna adjust the teeth, we're gonna do jaw measurements, and we're gonna get patient approval. Here's where the jaw measurements come in. All of these are critical for producing a high quality denture. And if you look at a lot of these digital denture techniques that are coming out over time, they're really trying to, to eliminate steps just like we're doing here, but many of them cut out the step of a patient approval. And I found with time that um, over the, my last 40 years that patient approval is critical. Um, number one, it allows the patient to put feedback into the, into the prosthesis, but number two, it prevents um, the agony of re-manipulating teeth in the final product once the patient sees them. So let's do all four steps right now. The first thing we're gonna do is seat bases. Um, since these bases are digitally milled or printed, they fit extremely well. There's no processing errors. 
they actually will fit as well as the final denture, which has a great advantage for um, making our interclusal records as we'll do here. There might be some adjustments. Noting that any adjustment you make on this denture base now will be rescanned and be reflected in the final product as we work along. So in other words, you're gonna adjust the denture once right now. Shortening flanges is a typical thing you might do. Um, that will be reflected in the final product. You don't have to shorten that flange twice. Anything you've done will be reflected in the final denture. So they fit fine. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time there. They, they fit real well. Many times you'll have, well, you'll have the same section you'll have in the final prosthesis. That makes everything else easier. Now adjusting teeth. I'm gonna di digress just a little bit and talk about how I choose my tooth setups. Um, in my opinion, there's three ways of approaching a denture um, articulation. One is to, or the aesthetics. One is to have the denture look like the patient's original teeth. Um, you do that from photographs, you do that from relatives. I don't seem to do that a lot anymore. I know they do it a lot in Europe, but generally I don't make a denture based on the patient's original teeth from a position's side. The second thing is a when a patient comes in with a denture, um, they want the denture the way it looks. Um, I end up making a denture that looks like a bad denture. Whatever they want, they've got it. I've tried to improve dentures over time to make them more aesthetic, and I, I can guarantee I remake dentures more often with this mistake than any other. Primarily what I do is a patient comes in and they ask for a denture setup that's ideal. So I'm gonna explain my philosophy for that. And um, it's easy to explain to dental assistants. I think it's something that new technicians can use. And I think it might be applicable for you too. Um, in my opinion, beauty is symmetry. At least part of beauty is symmetry. And if you look at a model or an actress, typically they have a very symmetrical face. Studies have been done that have shown that people with symmetry in their face are by and large considered to be more aesthetic. So to sort of test this here, I took uh, Jennifer Lopez's picture out of a, off the internet, divided it in the middle and used Photoshop to do that right to right facial reconstruction and left side to left side facial reconstruction, knowing that if those, um, if her face is symmetrical, that the face should be pretty similar. So this is what I ended up with. The face on the left is a little thinner, but I mean, I think all in all, her face is fairly symmetrical. So the idea of symmetry and beauty, I think, holds out here. Now, I did the same thing to myself, and um, I'm obviously not quite as symmetrical as some people. One person said the guy on the right um, is desperate for a date, never had one. The guy on the left wouldn't know what a date was if you, you know, if it was offered him. Um, so my face isn't symmetrical, but um, I think symmetry plays a big part. I did the same thing to these teeth, which I think are beautiful. This is a natural young smile. And I divided it down the middle and created a right to right and left to left uh, contrast. And I found, I feel that these teeth are really pretty similar, um, showing that there's a great symmetry in this beauty. The difference really is in the laterals. If you look at it, the one on the left is in uh, lingual version. The laterals on the right are in labial version. That's the only difference. So, so this is kind of my philosophy. I try to get symmetry by giving mirror images of eight, nine, and six, and 11. I rarely vary those in some of the ones that ideal aesthetics, but I use the the laterals to kind of break the monotony, break the idea of the mannequin look that could come from two straight of teeth. And those are the teeth that I play with. So in other words, using six, to, six um, eight, nine, and 11 as symmetrical and mirror, mirrored to each other and playing with uh, seven and 10, that's the way I develop my aesthetics. Um, the, so we've got that in, in, in mind. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the face and we're gonna look at where we position these teeth in the, um, 
um, onto the WTI. Bear in mind, these teeth have been placed all from the measurements that you were taken, all based on it based in the computer and determined by the computer and the designer. So the first thing I do is I look at the face and see if I have the midline in the middle. My best reference for the midline is the filtrum, but you could also take uh, dental floss, put it over the whole face and determine the midline in any technique that you like. Then I look at the horizontal plane. Did we determine the horizontal plane based on the tergomaxillary notches properly. Is there a cant to it? I make a note of it. Then I have the patient speak. And what I'm looking for here is when the patient says an F sound, like 50 to 60, I look to see if the incisal edge fits, hits the wet dry line of the lower lip. That's where it should hit in speech, right where the dry lip and the wet lip meet, the wet dry line. If the teeth are not hitting the lip, they're, they're posterior, I, I know that I need to bring the teeth out. If they're hitting the dry portion of the lip when they say 50 to 60, I know I need to bring the teeth back. I make a note of it. I then uh, look at the, the exposure of the maxillary lip and see if it's natural. Um, we know that the flange doesn't affect the position of the lip. It's the position of the central incisors that do. If the teeth are too far um, in, the, the lip will turn under. If they're too far out, the lip will evert. So you look at that and make a sense of it. Then I take um, retractors and just look at the whole overall look of the setup. I look and see if the, an appropriate buccal corridor was formed. I get a sense of symmetry. Um, I get a sense of, of the overall horizontal position of the teeth, just a general overall look. Then I take, and, um, take the maxillary um, impression, and I, I meant to show, let me go back one slide. I mentioned that this wax is not traditional setup wax. This is a wax that if you warm it in barely warm water, 110 to 120 degrees for a couple minutes, you can push the teeth around in that wax and they won't fall out. In other words, you don't need to have a number seven wax spatula and a Bunsen burner chair side to move these teeth. Any changes that we need to make, realizing this, these are positioned in an average position, and they might need to be characterized, changed. They can be done by just pushing them after the uh, material is warmed. So what we're gonna do now is take that maxillary impression, drop it down into 110 to 120 degree water for um, about a minute. It's not very hot. If it gets too hot, it doesn't work. The material actually will get sticky. But at 110 to 120, which is really barely heated water, uh, it'll soften. And I usually leave it in about a minute. So watch here. If I move one to move the tooth up, I just push it. If I want to rotate the tooth, I rotate it. Any change that you make can be made without pulling the tooth out and without having to um, um, actually grind on it or position. Remember, we, we have a very thin base and we have very thin teeth. You have plenty of room to move the teeth around. Take your time, make any corrections you want, make any um, aesthetic characterizations that make your teeth look lifelike and uh, change it in that warm wax. This is one of the big secrets. You can't do that in traditional wax. If you try to move a tooth and set up wax, it'll pop out. It won't in this wax. Once you're done, take your maxillary impression, just put it in cold tap water. It'll harden back up to a rigid state. Next is jaw measurements. This is where most of your questions have come. We haven't taken jaw measurements yet. We're gonna do it right now. And what we're gonna do is, I'm, I'm gonna just use whatever technique you feel comfortable with. I'm gonna show you mine. 
I just like in dental school from USC in the 70s, I dot the nose, I dot the chin, and then I have my dental assistant stand the patient up and I measure a distance that gives me vertical dimension of rest. This takes a little time. They lick their lips. Stay, I find that they're standing. It's a little bit more natural for them. I want to find the digital position of rest. In a class one patient, an angles class one patient, the distance between the vertical dimension of rest and the vertical dimension of occlusion is typically around three millimeters. So I'm going to make a measurement and determination of vertical dimension of occlusion, decreasing my vertical dimension of rest three millimeters. And I'm going to do it by taking the lower tray and putting it in 110 to 120 degree water for about three or four or five minutes. I want that, that lower wax to soften very much like alu wax. In other words, I'll just drop it in place, let it um, soften all the way around. It becomes, I, I mean, remember alu wax, it's just very soft, very pliant. Let it sit for a couple minutes. Then I take the softened lower tray, the lower base, place it in the mouth, seat it. I take the rigid upper base, remember we chilled it in cold water, all the teeth are stable now, and place that in the mouth. And then I have the patient close until the distance between the nose, the two dots on the nose, is three millimeters shorter than my vertical dimension of rest. In other words, you can see now where the dot on the chin is, it's three millimeters closed. This might take a few times. If they overclose, remember the wax is soft, take it out, squeeze the wax posterior and raise it up again, have them go through the process. If they haven't closed enough, you can just have, it, um, have them bite into it a little harder. Then I have them close until, then I, excuse me, then I take those lower anterior teeth, which are one block of teeth, and position them one millimeter in one millimeter over jet and one millimeter vertical overlap. And you could take them bodily since they're all one piece and quickly position them in that softened wax. Remember, you've moved the teeth presumably when you were characterizing it and we've now determined, now determined vertical dimension of occlusion. Now we find the right place for those lower teeth. We can now give a patient a mirror and have them look at it and give us patient approval. Remember, we have maxillary teeth that go from 6 to 12, I mean, from 5 to 12, and we have lower teeth in place. We have the vertical dimension of occlusion of stabilized, centric relation stabilized. They can now look at that denture, and to my eye, that looks great. I mean, it looks characterized. It doesn't look like a denture. The patient can look at it, give me approval. If they want to do any changes, it's easy for me to do. I can just warm up the up maxillary cast, move the teeth a little bit, no problem. Then I have the patient talk to me. Since these bases fit so well, they're usually pretty stable and they're usually stable enough that the patient can, can speak. And I can look and see if, it, if I'm getting good S sounds. That comes from the position of the maxillary teeth and the mandibular teeth. My F sounds, I can see here, you know, see if the, the, the voice sounds normal. It, it's, um, this is, this is an additional step they could use with a stabilized, with stabilized denture. Then the patient takes a look at it, they're happy. I then take it and record that vertical dimension of occlusion, centrical relation, using quite a bit of some sort of um, interocclusal material, a PVS like Regisil or Blue Moose. And I'm going to now send this to the laboratory for the second laboratory uh, procedure. Remember, it's very important to get this PVS interclusal record because it's going to be used later on. So off it goes. We're at lab two. In lab two, the um, laboratory in Avident is either going to uh, produce a dense splice serona digital denture, denture designed by Avident meaning that the 
file, the design file is created at Avident and sent to your local lab. The local lab can then produce in-house a digital denture milled using a Lucitune 199 portrait plug, I mean, excuse, uh, plug using portrait um, IPN teeth. This is something that can be done locally. Uh, the teeth are looted into place into sockets and all the teeth are positioned in a position that uh, you've determined on the WTI. And the denture looks fabulous. The other thing they can do is produce a dense splice Rona digital denture engineered by Avident. In other words, they're going to do the design and the production of the denture in Phoenix. And, and they're going to, they are the only ones that can produce this monolithic denture. And this is something you really want to take a look at. You're looking at a denture here that has no natural teeth, no carded teeth, no denture teeth in place. These are all milled out of one piece of resin. It's a proprietary technique. Um, if you look at it in cross section, there's no way a tooth could pop out of this denture because <clears throat> there's no denture, to, no denture tooth to pop out. In other words, the denture tooth itself is an integral part of the base and gives strength to both to, to the entire denture rather than taking um, strength away like a traditional tooth would do. This is real important when you have a milled uh, denture sitting over an implant. Um, if you look at those teeth there, if those were, were bonded teeth and the denture was ground out this way, those teeth would pop out in a second. They won't out of the milled monolithic denture. That's real important in cases like this all on four where you don't have a lot of room for resin or teeth. Um, bonded teeth traditionally pop out of all on fours pretty quickly. Um, and especially look at this maxillary denture. It was just very little uh, room to work with. A monolithic denture plays a great part here. So, okay, clinical three. We're at our third and final appointment uh, at the chair, and we're going to basically deliver the denture. Remember I said any changes that you made appointment two will be reflected in appointment three. The laboratory scans all surfaces, the cameo and Italio surfaces, and scans the denture put together with your interclusal record. All of it is redone based on your WTI. Um, the final product is, I can guarantee you, is gorgeous. Um, the workmanship of the bonded denture or the monolithic denture are really second to none. I don't think I've ever seen a better denture in my career. Um, and basically, since I've already adjusted, I put it, the patient, put it in the patient's mouth. I take two cotton rolls. I have them hold it for five minutes, remove the cotton rolls. And most of the time, it's retentive and it's got pretty good starting occlusion. I mean, look at this occlusion. Um, I like lingualized occlusion. That's what I ordered here. And this is my first carbon uh, determination of bite. And actually, I'm very happy with what I see. There's minimal adjustments needed. I don't have any contacts on the anterior section. Um, I mean, I would be pleased if all my dentures looked this way. And to be honest with the WTI, many, many of them do. Um, I place it in the patient's mouth. The patient is thrilled. The aesthetics are done. We're probably 15 minutes into the 30 minute third appointment. Um, we're done. Listen, thank you. Uh, we're going to sp spend time now. We've got about 10 minutes. I've got a lot of questions to answer. Um, I think they're real appropriate. We'll go through them. Uh, this was kind of a whirlwind tour of the um, Avident Wagner digital protocol. Remember, it's online. You can watch it on, on YouTube. This is my personal email, bigjawbone at mac.com. Feel free to communicate with me. We've got a lot of dental schools using this technique. It's been promoted through the entire VA system. They're recognizing a three appointment technique that produces a high quality denture, is great for vets. So this is something that you'll be seeing in schools and, and um, 
be advertised more and more over time. So why don't we start uh, answering some of the questions that have been come up. The first one, I, mean, I think, goes back to the impression itself. One person asked, won't, won't the, the tray burn them when it comes out of the water? At 160, it doesn't. Um, it's like hot tea water. I don't think I've ever had a complaint about heat from that tray. Uh, the tray does cool down quickly. Occasionally, you'll have to reheat it so you can shape it to your needs. But generally, that, I mean, I've actually, it's never been a problem. So it won't burn the patient. Another question that came out early was determining VDO. I mean, you would think that we would be taking VDO with appointment one, but I don't think that's the right time to do it. I'd much rather do it when I have teeth set up, I have a clean base, I have something that's more denture-like when I make my determination. So we did an appointment too. A couple other patients uh, asked that question. Um, one person asked a question about occlusal plane. The maxillary occlusal plane comes from the position of the central incisors and a posterior point that comes from the old Swiss dent technique of Frush and Fisher. And what they did is they measured from what they call the hamular notch at that time down about 10 millimeters, and they felt that that was a great posterior point to create a average anterior posterior plane. We didn't go into it, but you can change the occlusal plane if you wish to. Um, you do it by just manipulating those front and uh, anterior teeth or actually grinding on the, the molars. Can you comment, please, about an upper partial with teeth from uh, upper cusp to cusp? Um, can you please comment? I have an upper partial with teeth from upper cusp to cusp. I'm not really sure what's being asked there, um, but we could talk about a um, single denture. This technique can be used equally well with a single maxillary mandibular denture. All you have to do is record the um, make a, a copy of the opposing model, either digitally or traditionally, and you can make a single uh, denture as well. Um, one of the questions was, how was the lab able to set the teeth without mounting the cast? Well, they did it in average, and, they, and we know it's an average. We know it's going to be close to the patients uh, just because they're, those measurements are tried and true, but they're not perfect. But remember, we can move them in that wax with, with ease. And so the idea is that we give you just a great start, and you turn it into the denture that's uniquely yours. How is this different from making non-digital dentures aside from, uh, that's all I got on that one. Um, I think the question would be, I think it's, we, we're not changing any of the techniques that we've learned in dental school. All of those techniques using a five appointment technique are in our WTI protocol. We just did them in a different manner, and we did them, I think, a little bit more effectively. So it's really no different than a non-digital denture. The final product is stronger, more aesthetic, less staining. All of this is in the literature. Um, more dense. The, the, the pucks themselves are processed, processed at 10 to, I say 40,000 pounds of pressure. I don't think it's quite right, but a lot of pressure. So they're very dense. Um, very little areas for staining. It, it's, it's, a, it's a traditional denture on steroids, put it that way. Okay, uh, one of the questions was about an overbite. This technique that I showed you here is really for a patient with an angles class one jaw position. Class twos, class threes, you'll need to modify this technique. And, and if you're not doing a lot of dentures, it might be a good idea to refer that out. Um, remember, the, the most important decision you make for the success of a denture is, is picking the patient. A patient with a large overbite might be better done by a specialist. Um, we have about six more minutes. Um, oh boy, we've got a lot more questions. Let me see what we have here. How do you get started with Avidan? Contact your lab and have the lab contact the Avidan representative. All of this is done through, um, through your laboratory. It's been shown that, and I mean, I, I feel it wholeheartedly, the accumulated knowledge of denture making in the denture profession sits with your technician. It doesn't sit with the dentist, and I'm a dentist saying that. Technicians from, from student to teacher, from teacher to student, 
over the generations have really accumulated a body of knowledge that shouldn't be thrown out with this evident technique. There's a lot of things that your laboratory can help you with, especially if you don't make a lot of dentures. And uh, all, all, all the evident technique is doing is giving them another tool for their quiver. Dr. Wagner, this is Lisa. Um, we, um, you can go past. Um, said I said, I think I knew, or I should have known you from USC. I graduated in 1975, so it was a long time ago. Maybe we did. Um, how much vertical thickness is required for an implant-supported denture? Well, you know, really, for, to get good, strong resin, you need a couple millimeters. And with a lot of these bar-supported or bar-retained over dentures, you just don't have that space. And so what they're showing, what, what most of us are doing now are using that monolithic technique with bars, which gives you a chance of going to a minimal thickness. And we're using superstructures over bars, which gives a strength to the denture itself. We're not talking about that here, but um, there are ways to do it. And if you, if you contact me at bigjawbone.com or bigjawbone at mac.com, we can talk more about it personally. Dr. So Wagner, the, this is Lisa. Can uh, you hear me? Uh, uh, the occlusal plane, or I mean, excuse me, the um, choice of anatomic or monoplane teeth, um, it's really up to you. The WTI is set up flat plane, but you can request any occlusal scheme that you want. Uh, I like lingualized occlusion. Um, you can do flat plane occlusion. You can do what they call anatomic occlusion. You can't do balanced occlusion with this technique. We, we don't have the facial references and the jaw references to do it. Cost, um, go to the lab and find out. I don't have costs here. Um, if the lab doesn't know, they can contact the Avident representative at avident.com and um, work from there. Can we use any impression technique that we like? Absolutely. This impression that I showed you is just an accelerated technique, but um, the Wagner impression trays can be used with any border molding or impression making material you like. So pick what you want. I really like this uh, Aquasil technique and you might take a look at it. It's on, it's on the website. What about immediate dentures? We didn't go into it here, but it, uh, immediate dentures are extremely easy to do. It's on online. Uh, basically, you make impressions like you, you normally do. You make an interclusal record. Your laboratory scans that and Avident produces an immediate denture based on those, those measurements. So it's, it's probably the best way you can, um, you can uh, start with, with, with Avident. Try an immediate denture first. Uh, maybe try the WTI second. Another question I missed the um, first few minutes. Um, what about impression tr uh, about the impressions? Uh, contact me at uh, bigjobbone at mac dot com. Uh, we'll, we'll talk by phone. Okay, here's a maybe the last question. Um, what about digitally scanning the edentulous arches themselves? Um, it's coming. It's not. It's not easy. There's some articles in the literature. One by Goodacre you might look up. But um, the, it turns out the maxillary al edentulous alveolar ridge is reasonably easy to scan. The bottom one is a bear. Um, it's coming. I prefer to have you actually scan the impressions. I mean, remember, an impression makes a copy of the gums, but it also displaces tissues at the same time. So um, I think unless you have a lot of dexterity at this point, a lot of experience, um, possibly in the future, it's going to be the routine. But at this point, I'd say just make your traditional impression and then let's scan that. It's 6.59. Um, I hope this was of help to you. It's just a beginning. Contact me. I'd love to talk with you. Um, I'm really excited about this, and I hope this can become something that is a, a benefit to, to all your practices. Thank you.